Welcome to Goldfish on Games, where we're in the middle part of our look at this machine, the Acorn Risk PC 600. Today we'll be looking at its software, and more importantly, its games. If you've not seen it, check out part 1 first, which we ended having briefly looked at the OS. So let's take a look at it in a bit more detail, shall we? And what better way to do that than get a new game on this machine? And thankfully, there have been a number of projects that have legally gotten games archived and released for free. So I've downloaded and copied one such game to this floppy disk. That game is a favourite of mine, Exor. With the disk opened, we can see the file with its extension changed to a slash zip. If you remember, this OS doesn't have extension support, so it doesn't know what to do with it. But we have a few options for getting those files out of it. First off, we can just start an unzipper like Sparkplug, which will place an icon in the app tray, and now we can just drag the file onto the icon, and it will open up in a window where we can copy the files out. Simple, though Sparkplug doesn't allow us to run the program from inside the zip. And you might also have noticed that the icon has changed, and that is because Sparkplug has updated the metadata for the file to tell it that it's an archive file, which we can check by just looking at its properties. So now if we double click on the file, it will open it up again in Sparkplug. Another approach is to use a file system module, such as SparkFS. Riscos is actually quite clever in how it handles file systems, as they're not limited to drives, but can work on individual files. What that means is if I change the file type to zip, and then open it in SparkFS, it ends up looking and working just like a regular folder. And this works so well that you can actually even run the program directly from the zip file. This is something that Windows eventually got in XP, and was more of a hack on Explorer than an extendable system. I can even update the file on the floppy disk, change it to a zip, and then open it and then run XOR directly from the floppy disk. This really does show how flexible the file system was and it will make it easier for us to do some work later on in this episode, as well as working with other operating systems, as we'll find in part 3. The game itself just looks like any other program that we've seen so far, just a regular bang file. But what if I told you it's actually a folder? If you hold down the shift key, and then double click, you'll actually enter the folder rather than start it. And here we can see the contents of the game. And there are a few common parts to all applications. So we have these two files, boot and run. These are actually script files, like what we wrote in part one. And this will be used to start the game up. And it tells it what sort of files it needs to use and sets up any modules that are required. And Sprite is an image collection that contains the icon as well as other pictures required for the program. And with this information, we can actually see boot is actually a program. So if we shift click it, we can then see inside that we have runs, boots, and a load of other folders that we would then use to extend the operating system. It's all really quite clever and makes it a simple way to package up programs and still allow for easy editing. The shift click can even be used on scripts themselves. If you remember that basic script we wrote in part one, well, if we double click on it, it'll just run. But if we shift double click on it, it will actually open it up in the editor. The base OS also came with a number of programs. We've already seen the text editor, and we had a quick look at the image editor at the end of the first part. But it also came with software for viewing, as well as editing, vector art images. And now these are really are quite detailed. On top of that, we had the typical clocks, and even a magnifying glass, if you really needed to zoom in to a part of the screen. There is also quite a detailed music editor, which I have to say I have almost zero skills at using. And this brings us on to the games. Now it didn't get a large number of them, it did get some very good ones. Being a home micro, the games came out in a mixture of boxes. Here I have a few that I've managed to get my hands on. One is a compilation, and the other is a more recent title. But if you look around, we can find they mostly followed the stylings of the Amiga. And speaking of the Amiga, this machine got quite a few Amiga ports, which arrived all through the life of the earlier Archimedes, and then with the RISC PC later on. 
though for the most part they do seem to be based on the original Amiga versions rather than the upgraded AGA releases. A combination of having to write their own mod player and the fact that the hardware had more audio channels meant that most games tended to have music and sound effects playing at the same time, which wasn't something that all Amiga users could experience. Though one of the downsides is that because it didn't have a joystick port as standard, many games just used the keyboard for controls, and tended to use layouts that 8-bit gamers would recognise, such as ZNX for left and right, and slash and single quote for up and down. The fire key could be anything, but most of the time it would be the enter key. While it wasn't common for most developers to port their own games to the machine, there were some companies like Chrysalis who actually got quite a few of the licenses from other publishers and ported the games themselves. For the most part, the games looked very similar to their source material, as the Archimedes did generally have more power to work with than the Amiga, but some of the more fancy effects that used copper tricks tended to be left out or massively reduced, like those full screen raster effects and unfortunately other games were not correctly frame limited, so tend to run a little bit too fast on later hardware. There wasn't many of them, but there was actually a number of titles that would actually run in a window, or full screen, which is great when they could be played in a window, because it meant that you could very quickly close them when you needed to get back to what you were actually meant to be doing at school. But the advantage of it being full screen was that it didn't have to share resources with the base machine which didn't really matter for these early games and the Risk PC, but it would have been a much bigger deal for the older Archimedes and some of the later ports that we'll see. And because it straddled that point between Amiga and PC, it also got a number of MS-DOS ports, both officially and unofficially. First up is Alone in the Dark, which was officially ported and released with the Archimedes and Risk PC two years after the PC version. And for the most part, it's a very good port. It looks good, it runs smoothly, and even has the same copy protection as the DOS release. The only real downside I've found so far is the fact that it's missing music. I'm guessing it must have been too much work to convert the tracks or to write a sound driver that would have replicated a MIDI device, so they just stuck with the digital sound effects. Next up is a game that featured in a previous video, Wolfenstein 3D, which not only works great, but the developers actually went the extra mile and had both sound effects and music. With the rise of source ports, Riskos finally got its own port of Doom, which you can even run in a window. But remember, this machine only has a 30 megahertz CPU and 60 megabytes of RAM. So it's a little choppy and it's much better to run it in full screen. I also found that reducing the detail as well as the screen size helped improve the gameplay. But that isn't all that different to how you would have played it on a 30 MHz 486. This would have been very impressive if it had been released back in the day, as later machines would have had a faster ARM 700 or strong ARM CPU which would have been much better at running the game. As mentioned earlier, there are a number of legal ways of getting games for free, including the amazing JASP project that pulls together disc images, manuals, covers, even the copy protection into a single legal package. 
This has also helped spur development of ADFFS, a floppy drive emulator file system. This means you can load the disk images and the system will see them just as if they were in a regular drive, which is another great example of the extensibility of the file system model. The software will also help auto configure the machine to give it the best chance of running the game, as many were written for older Archimedes with slower processors or different address bus size. And that project helped me check out some of the most amazing games that either came out first or only for the Acorn machines. One of the games that I used to play the demo of all the time was Chocks Away, a flight sim that was less about being serious and more about having fun. And boy, did we have fun with it at school. Just flying around that map was so amazing and so smooth. Though I have to say, with the extra CPU power in this machine, it's just a little too fast. But it doesn't take anything away from it, as the missions tend to pit you against a number of enemy units as well as a target to take out. And if you find it too difficult, you can always get a mate to join you in split screen or over a serial cable. This is definitely one that you really should check out, even if it was slightly overshadowed by the developer's next game. And that next game was this, Starfighter 3000 which might look a lot like Star Fox at first glance, but it's actually far more complex in both its gameplay and its looks. With alterable textured terrain, lots of buildings, craft and objects to shoot, that when destroyed will give you money that you can use at the shop to upgrade your attack craft, with better guns, shields, faster engines, rockets, bombs, the works. And when you really need to get that drop on a particular enemy or building, you can take your ship and fly it into space, and you can see the whole world and fly back down at your target at a steep angle. Though I will say, it is a bit of a hard game. I've just about completed the first mission a few times, but always get taken out near the end. Even with using those afterburners to try and get away from the firepower that will be thrown at you, it's still quite an epic. This is actually probably one of the more famous Archimedes games, as it was popular enough to get ports to various other machines, including the ARM-powered 3DO. The cute looking hamsters hides a dark game inside as you're dropped into a world that's overrun by the furry animals. And you, with your massive hammer, have to reduce the population. Once you get past the slightly grim task at hand, and possibly change the gore settings to something that suits yourself, you'll find an interesting puzzle platformer underneath. As not only do you have to use your hammer to dispatch those various critters that occupy each level, but you also have to use it to launch yourself into the air. And because of that, you'll have to be careful how much power you put into your swings, as that affects how far you go flying, and if you end up bouncing off all the walls. Next, we have the game of the box that we featured earlier, Sally and Wally. Another cute looking game, but this time it's not hiding anything apart from a solid title. Which is very much in the vein of Bubble Bubble, where you have to shoot monsters and then hit them to remove them from the level. Where they'll drop letters as well as power-ups that will help you through the hundred levels of platforming action. And following on from its inspiration, it also supports two players. Overall, it's a fun, if not entirely original title.
and to round out the games, I picked Exodus. An incredibly ambitious looking game, with a nicely done intro that even blends the copy protection into it. Which then reveals itself to be a 4x style game, we have to go out, colonise planets, fight battles, and complete one of the various objectives that you can set yourself at the start of the game, including your typical military, wealth, industrial, and scientific goals. You have to build up your planets by buying them and then placing your buildings and gaining credits and fighting units. And it won't be long before you're attacked. And if you're anything like me, you'll most likely lose your first battle as you try and work out what all the various icons on the map actually represent. This is definitely a game that I'll keep playing as it's right up my street and I wish I'd discovered it back in the day. As you can see we can really do a lot with the stock machine, but if you're like me, you want to try and push a home micro as far as it can go, because why else would you want a home micro? And if that interests you, then join me in part 3, where we'll be doing just that. So if you're interested, hit the subscribe button, hit that notification bell, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you then. So until then, I've been the Gouldfish, that was a seriously interesting operating system, and this was Gouldfish on Games. Thank you for watching my video, I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, please consider checking out the links on the screen right now to other videos that I've done, or please be patient while you wait for part 3 that should be coming soon. Thank you, and goodbye.